everybody has their list of problems. And the more you ask questions, the more problems people will tell you they have. Did you think the Deepox and the Jane Fondas and these kind of people will come or were you kind of shocked or surprised by that? Everybody that came to take a class with me was like, oh, thank you. I've always wanted to do yoga, but I didn't go because this person made me feel bad or this person injured me or whatever it was. Everybody had their yoga horror story mm -hmm. and they just didn't think, oh, I don't want to do this this way. But I didn't kind of buy into this. It has to be like this. So I thought, well, why can't it be better? Why can't anything be better? Because that leads to you feeling like yourself. That leads to feeling good in your body. That leads to choosing to move in a way that respects yourself. All of those techniques lead to the feelings that I was trying to get at. So what was your mental state like at that time? This is just before you get on this roller coaster called Trala Yoga. What were you feeling inside about yourself? Did you feel successful? Did you feel accomplished? Did you feel like you were still lacking in certain areas of your life? Um, I felt excited to be doing things for sure. This was kind of a stage in my life where I was meeting a lot of people in different industries and really trying to get involved with anything that I could get involved with that was creative and fun and maybe had a little bit of a yoga angle or health angle. But I remember meeting a guy who was interested in yoga and then he came across all these old Andy Warhol movies from this woman who was in one of the movies and no one had ever seen them. So I thought, well, this is really cool. Maybe I can help you put them together. We can go around and meet people and fundraise a little bit and Maybe I can be behind the scenes, help you get your movie made. Kind of. I thought that was really cool and interesting, just being in a room and watching those films. And only in New York, you can kind of meet somebody for one thing and find out all these other things. So I was doing all kinds of things. And also I was meeting through modeling people like us that were doing other things besides the picture taken. I mean, how stupid is it to just get the picture taken? So, you know, you sit around at a casting and I would meet somebody and, and talk with them and say, well, what do you what do you really like to do besides just looking how your face looks? And, you know, sometimes they would just go and sit on the other bench because they thought that I was being rude or whatever, but I was just being curious. But I met a lot of people who were interested in fitness or interested in clothing or interested in nutrition, all of these kinds of things that are so common now. So I was kind of thinking about putting a bunch of people together in a van and making some sort of show where we go to somebody's house and fix them up in a kind of way and thinking about those kind of things. Just how can I create opportunities that I get to be involved with that help people in this kind of well-being way, but maybe it's not necessarily doing one thing or, or another thing specifically. Mm. Okay. So you all uh, decide to start this yoga studio later a year or later that year after getting married. According to you, your parents don't have a whole lot of money. You're doing these like odd jobs. I mean, what, how, how is that? What were you thinking? In New York City, are you going to start a yoga studio on yeah. a budget? Yeah. Well, I mean, thankfully back then there wasn't really much to look up to. I mean, there were these big institutions where I would have in my mind that somebody must have just bought them that building because the building is there and it's never going away. So I started in, the, in Central Park. I sewed up a flag that just said free yoga in the park and everybody would come if they wanted to come or not. And Where was it in the park? It was by the, the castle, uh, mm -hmm. the pond with the castle. I'm forgetting what it's called. Yeah, so it was just by there. the theater, by yeah, the outdoor by the theater. Th yeah, yeah. 72nd yeah. Street, walk in from the west side. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really fun. And I met a lot of great people through that. And mm -hmm. Mike had this um, pretty oddly shaped rental apartment on 23rd and 5th. It was kind of a cut up weird building. And it was this big living room that you could fit 20 people in and then a little bedroom off to the side. So I remember the first time I went over to his apartment. It's like, this is great. Excuse me. <laughs> so when it got cold outside, we just moved it inside and that was, that became the Strala Yoga Studio because, you know, you have to have a name, I suppose. So mm -hmm. that became the studio for quite a long time. 
probably way past when we should have been doing things <laughs> without permission. You never had any problems with the building management or with park rangers or anybody like that coming no. up to you and saying, hey, what are you doing? Do you have a permit for this? Yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't mass scale. So in the park, it was just the flag and I didn't put it in the ground or anything. Like I had Mike and another friend, Sydney, they held it up in the beginning and we had a Facebook page. It said, just come here if you want to do yoga. And then when mm -hmm. the class started, we just leaned the flag on a tree and people would come. So it was just a group of, you know, 20 of us or whatever. Doing Those it. were the Village Voice classified days. Do you ever put yeah. Village Voice? That's how you, that is how you found out stuff. And Craigslist was just getting started too. Yeah. Craigslist, when I started doing yoga with people more and more, one of the people I did yoga with one-on-one -on -one said, you should put an ad on Craigslist. And I did for like a minute and then I got kind of nervous and took it. Beep, 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 beep. You never know. You're going to somebody's house. You know, you never know. You're fine. So. So, um, I know you guys became known as the studio that made it made yoga affordable in New York. Was that the intention from the very, very early days? Did you do these five and ten dollar classes? Yeah. I think like a lot of people, I wanted yoga to be accessible, but not just affordable, but also accessible in how how you do it, you know, in an easygoing way. But yeah, it was free for a long time, even at Mike's apartment. And then it kind of mm -hmm. became this thing where Again, I was doing other jobs, so it didn't need to be how I paid rent and things like that. But people would say, hey, you know, I'll pay five, ten dollars to come here just to sustain what you're doing. So you'll continue doing it and not get annoyed. And so, <laughs> so we eventually, you know, had a donation. We said you can pay five or ten dollars if you want. If you don't want to, that's fine as well. And then we just kept doing it and everything started to be okay. So I started this thing called The Shine in Los Angeles. And for the first several weeks or maybe even months, it was free. Then we decided to start, I decided to start to support uh, to help pay for stuff. And I noticed a difference in the percentage of people actually showing up and staying and blah, blah, blah. So I'm just curious for the young entrepreneur out there listening to this, uh, what was your experience with charging versus not charging? Did you notice anything, anything noteworthy? Oh, big time. So not charging. I thought, okay, this is the kind of person that loves to do yoga with me. They're the same kind of person that asks if they can sleep over and crash farm it, you know, <laughs> kind of a person without any boundaries. They, they really aren't going to leave. This is that kind of person. They have a house, they have the means, but they just kind of want to stay forever. And, and it could be yoga. It could also be drawing or canoeing. It doesn't matter what it is because it's just something free to do. So I started to realize, okay, this is the person that is coming here. And then when we started to, to make it a small fee, it changed for the better a hundred percent. The people that came really wanted to do yoga. They didn't just want to do something that was free because you can do that everywhere. You can look at the Village Voice and there's all this free activities to do. So cost wasn't an issue. It wasn't that we were getting super wealthy or super, you know, students or people that couldn't afford. But those things weren't in common. But what was in common was everybody wanted to do a yoga class in this way. So the crowd became more diverse in the kinds of people, but everybody had this one thing super solid in common, which didn't exist when it was free. And uh, you and Mike co-founded Strala. So talk a little bit about that. What was that like that? Because you're newly married and now you have this business you're sharing. Are you guys like cuddling up at night and then talking about work or yeah. Did you separate that? Was it intentional? Like, what are, what are some of those takeaways? Yeah, I think for me and probably for him as well, this is so much of what I think about all the time that I can't imagine having a work buddy and then coming home to my partner or whatever. So it just made sense for us, for sure. It was kind of a, well, we're doing this and let's go and do it. And there's no 
switch that we flip at this time. And now we're our normal selves doing our normal things, going off and raging or whatever. It's kind of all the time thinking about these things, thinking about how we want to spend our energy and just moving forward in that. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Okay. So you also began to write prolifically. So talk about that, how that affected your, your, your movement that you were starting. Yeah. So again, I got lucky. Um, a gal that came to the studio, it was like everybody's stories. <laughs> a gal that came to the studio worked at Huffington Post and mm -hmm. which at the time was a super only political blog. At least that's how I saw it. And she headed up the health section and she said to me, oh, would you like to take some of your videos that you're posting online and write a little article about it and post it up on our blog? And of course I said yes, because she thought this would be a good idea for me. So I started sharing these posts on Huffington Post and making these little articles about how yoga can be for all kinds of different things. So I, I kind of found this yoga for this, yoga for that, <laughs> you know, step and repeat kind of a thing. So yoga for breakups, yoga for back pain, yoga for headaches or whatever. And, and you were known as one of the first yogis to do this, right? This is before yoga with Adrian, you know, you were yeah. one of the first ones to use social media in this way as well. Yeah, I just, I found out about YouTube and, you know, I'm a big ham. So <laughs> I'm thinking I've got these friends back home that, you know, they're starting to have all their first problems and I'm meeting people in New York and they have all these problems and not everyone's going to walk into a yoga studio that they care about. So, and not everybody's going to want to click on a video that says yoga. But so <laughs> thing like, what's the issue here? And, and also I found out when I was talking to people, nobody wanted to do yoga, but people wanted to feel better in their bodies, feel better in their lives. Everybody has their list of problems. And the more you ask questions, the more problems people will tell you they have. And yoga, at least the way I was understanding it, is so rich in its vocabulary that, of course, a five minute video isn't going to solve your problem, but it'll start to give you some hints and some clues into what's happening with you. So for me, it was just super exciting and off to the races. You know, I'd get little messages from people saying, ah, oh, I did this video. I feel better. I'm like, yay, good for you. No, so it was fun. Were you in the Broadway studio at this point? When that HuffPost person, our editor came, came to the class? Uh, no, that was still in Mike's apartment. Okay. Yeah. How did she find out about it? She found out about it, I think, from her friend, Emily, who was just on Facebook, not even a friend of mine or something, but just one, one of these kind of natural friend of a friend of a friend of a friend sharing kind of, oh, I went to that. You should come to mm -hmm. that, too. And that was kind of the beginning of real life word of mouth, but then also mm -hmm. Facebook word of mouth, because everybody on Facebook has... 50 friends, 100 friends, whatever, that also live in the neighborhood. So mm. that was that was happening. And when these people were coming, I had no idea, as it happens a lot, what people do for their job unless they say something, which for me is just a lot also more interesting just to talk about what's going on with you, how you're feeling, what's happening. And then you find out later, oh, I work for HuffPo or I'm solving the climate crisis. <laughs> What, what did you, what kind of reputation did you want your, your classes to have when people were sharing about it, word of mouth, how, because I know this probably came up in your teaching. You seem to be, um, anti, you know, Sanskrit and all that and making it accessible as possible. But what did you want people to say about, Hey, I just took this class and it was dot, dot, dot. Gosh, my, my dream response would be, I just took this class. And I feel so good. I feel like myself. It's yoga 
you know, at least back then, it doesn't sound so relevant now because there's so much, but back then it's yoga, but without all that stuff you don't like about yoga or it's yoga, but you get to be your, you get to continue to be yourself. You don't have to try or pretend, you know, something else about yourself. And then at that time, everybody knew what you were talking about. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go there because that place made me feel like I couldn't relax. I couldn't be myself. I had to fit into this category, fit into this box. So yeah, yoga was very serious in New York back then, even in the gyms. I went to Equinox yeah. and I remember, and I didn't know any different. I just thought, okay, this is yoga. This is what yoga is. No one played music. It was very serious, you know? Um, there's this guy named James Brown. Did you ever go to any of his classes? Oh. James Brown. There were a couple of James Browns, but the one in New York, he was the one that kind of introduced me to my first meditation circle. And I, I really liked him a lot, but it, looking back, it was very serious. And I think that's just what people thought yoga needed to be in order for it to be properly considered yoga. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, definitely. But I, I and I'm fine with that. I, I'm fine as a participant going to that. But also, I mean, like you, I saw all the issues with that as well. Not just the seriousness of it, but what people can do with that power when they have this serious attitude. You know, I saw a lot of people taking advantage of other people in classes and just with this kind of social power trip kind of a thing, you know, almost a class category, like I'm here and you're here and, or I'm going to push you into this pose or being somebody who's pretty capable physically you know, I, I would be called to go into the center of the room and do a backbend and everybody would clap for me. And then I would feel so stupid. <laughs> what? I just felt embarrassed, you know, and I didn't learn anything except, is that really what we're doing here? I so, used to find that so weird that people would clap after someone did a pose and it was just like, what are we doing here? And this is what crazy. Are, um, that. <laughs> So did you get any pushback from anyone when they oh. saw that, oh, wait, she's not, she's not calling it chaturanga. She's not calling it, are you, uh, you know, whatever. And how did you deal with, with that? Yes, absolutely. So I was so protective and excited because everybody that came to take a class with me was like, oh, thank you. I've always wanted to do yoga, but I didn't go because this or that, or this person made me feel bad or this person injured me or whatever it was. Everybody had their yoga horror story mm -hmm. that, that was mm -hmm. coming to me. And then all my yoga friends, whether it was, you know, to my face or via very serious email, like, what the hell? <laughs> Firing it off. And, and I knew that, I knew that my friends and the yoga community would be, riled up by what I was doing because I was essentially by doing what I was doing without even saying I don't like what you're doing was also saying there's a different way that you can do this and help people feel like themselves while they're doing this yoga thing that you love too and now that I have like many years from that kind of punk feeling that I had was so many of those teachers it's not their fault they were having me come up in the room and clapping because they were taught that by their teacher and they were taught that by their teacher and they just didn't think, oh, I don't want to do this this way. But I, I didn't kind of buy into this. It has to be like this. So I thought, well, why can't it be better? Why can't anything be better? So yeah, there was a lot of angry people coming at me for sure. But now they're all my friends again, so it's fine. Well, it also kind of helps you find your own voice as well. In my experience, it took me about five or seven years. No, I would say about five years to find my voice and to stop parroting the, my teachers and, you know, whatever else I heard or read um, regarding yoga. What would you say led to you finding your voice the most? Was it your writing or was it just volumes, just teaching class after class after class or a combination? Yeah, I think all of it. And then reluctantly watching Mike move in my class and then eventually 
hearing Mike talk about Tai Chi and in the movement, because then once I started learning about his whole background of why he came to yoga mm -hmm. and started to give me actual language besides, I don't like that, or just do it this way, you know, all these kind of immature language that I've had my whole life into soften, allow your breath to move you, move well, like this kind of a really clear, concise language, because that leads to you feeling like yourself, that leads to feeling good in your body, that leads to choosing to move in a way that respects yourself. All of those techniques lead to the feelings that I was trying to get at. So if I look at, you know, a class of my own in my head 10 years ago, I wouldn't be horrified at it, but I was kind of trying to lead the endpoints of the feeling like just if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Instead of now, I know how to get people to do what feels good by leading them step by step how to do it in a way. So I think it was very useful for that time in my life, but also that time in maybe just, you know, the people that were coming and what they wanted and needed. And thankfully, hopefully I'm getting better. <laughs> okay, so at this point, um, I'd love to hear how you knew it was time to go to a larger, like to really commit and get that larger studio. Um, and what was your vision before you took that leap of faith? What was your vision for you and for Strava and everything you were creating? Yeah. So I think the first time I met you, we were in that, we were in that crunch gym space. No, 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 no. I met you. I met you right as you guys moved into the new Broadway space. Yeah, so we were at 623 Broadway, and then we moved over to 632. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right, you're right. Okay. I think you came in with Tracy, like, a That's long right. time. That's right. That's know, right. Just, just right. to say hi. In 2007. We were, yeah, we were just sitting around knitting mm -hmm. weirdos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Tracy Curry. Was, yeah, yeah. So that was a month-to-month -month space, and that space was awesome because that's where I had learned yoga, too. That was the old Crunch Gym Mm -hmm. And it was just an abandoned building and there was literally grass coming up in the shower and the landlord just said, fine, you can have the fifth floor. And it wasn't even that expensive, but we didn't have access to bathrooms or anything else. So there was a space across the street that was beautiful. And a friend of ours that was coming to classes that had uh, real estate experience said, oh, you should try to get uh, a legit space. And I'm like, well, why would they give me a legit space? Oh, so well, you can pay the rent, but also I think that the landlord kind of likes yoga and things like this, and he'll probably like what you're doing. It's an office building, but just go in and check it out. And it was one of those situations where the landlord, it was, it was kind of like the soup Nazi. Either they like you or they don't. She, <laughs> you don't ask too many questions. Uh, yeah, just exactly. Because he, he was one of these old New York landlords that was going to be afraid if there was a bunch of stinky hippies coming around. Mm. So I had to like go in and, oh, this is very serious and we're very nice people and we clean the bathrooms. <laughs> so yeah, we got ourselves a, a legit lease at 632 Broadway. So yeah, it was, it was on from there, but we made it really simple. We still just brought the couch over and our friend Adam Gordon, who helped us get the lease, helped us, you know, put in a wall for a changing room, but that was it. It was just kind of a white box and I wanted to keep it really simple so people could feel their own experience without feeling this impression of something the space was putting on them. Did you think if I build it, they will come, the Deepox and the Jane Fondas and these kind of people will come or were you kind of shocked or surprised by that? Well, J everything was already going in that direction. So I wasn't too worried about it. I mean, I kind of did the math on the classes and then the rent and some workshops we were leading. And I'm like, okay, like it'll, it'll work out. It'll be fine. Um, so, so I knew that would be okay. But at the time, Jane had been to the studio across the street where I met you and I had met Tao Prashan Lynch at that time too. And she was 92 years old. And I had just met Jane who was 72. And I really wanted to introduce them because I'm like, Jane, this could be your mother. <laughs> you probably should hang out. So we did this class and Tao taught and Jane came 
and Jeanette Jenkins happened to be in town and it was just so cool. Everybody just kind of showed up, not for me, but for the people and the experience of being there. So we were already having these kind of exciting moments at the studio. Our Saturday class was exciting. So there was a few moments that I knew that if we commit to paying a good amount of money every month, that will be okay. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.